we are all dispensable. <laughs> like as an as a an as an employee, as a member of a team, everyone is dispensable, right? Even me. We talk about this in our organization all the time. I I may be the boss. I may own forty nine companies. I may you know arguably I'm one of the most well known industrial automation engineers on the planet. I'm certainly one of the top three foremost spokespeople for industry 4.0 in the world, right? I'm really, really well known. Everybody wants me to architect their projects and lead, you know, organizations want me to come in and evaluate them and stuff. But even, even I an answer to people like as a, as a business owner, e even I have bosses and those bosses are my customers, right? If my customers aren't happy, okay, I, I'm still answering to them. Okay. Um, and, and I can get fired too by the customer. Okay. And the same goes true for even just like, you know, for rank and file employees who I think oftentimes think, you know, people who are running companies, they don't answer to anyone. No, they answer to a lot more people than a, a rank and file employee. A rank and file employee only answers to their direct supervisor. Really? But, the higher you move up the food chain, the more people you have to answer to. Okay. My father, I, I've mentioned this before, but my dad used to tell me that there was, you know, there are a couple of numbers that everyone needed to know. And that is exactly how much they cost and actually exactly how much they generate. Okay. And the, the general number is if I cost a hundred thousand dollars a year to employ, I need to generate in indirect and direct revenue about $300,000, three X of what I cost in order for, it to, to in order for an organization to be able to justify having me keep me around All right we were talking about this internally as a team you know why is our society structured the way it is like why do we have employers and employees why do we have um why do we go buy shit at stores like why is it we don't just have a cistern underneath our house where we store all the fruits and vegetables we grew last year the answer is it's because growing your own shit takes way more work then go into a job and trading the capital, the money that you you earned by trading your specialized skill. It takes a lot more work to grow your own shit and store it. And there's a lot more risk, you know, blight and bugs. And, you know, the, the risk of starvation is much higher if you're not in a civilized society. But the, the cost of being in a civilized society is the social contract argument is that I'm going to trade a specialized skill that I have. OK, I'm going to trade a specialized skill for money that I'm going to trade for other people's specialized skills. Right. That's how our economy works. Why do we build organizations? Why isn't everyone an independent contractor? Right. This is a really important question. Lots of people are trying to become independent contractors. Well, why is it that all people aren't independent contractors? Well, the answer is, is because teams, if built correctly, are more than the sum of their parts. So what does that mean? It means that if I, if the maximum output that I can put out as an independent contractor is N, okay, and I take six independent contractors and I put them together and the, and the synergy is right. Dynamically, we got the right, their strengths are the correct. We have a subject matter expert who's really good at like organizational psychology. And I got a subject matter expert who's really good at some functional capability that we're going to take directly to market. You take all those people, you put them together, they can become more than the sum of their parts. That is, their output could be greater than 6N. It could be literally like 10N or 12N or 18N. And the, and the delta between summing up all of their productivity as individuals and, and what the sum of productivity is when they're working together as a group, that delta, the delta between 6N and 12N or 18N, is additional is additional value that goes into our economy that is used to take care of the people who can't take care of themselves the people whose output is 0.3 n or 0.6 n the problem we run into is when people who are really capable of that is their potential their capability is they can do n output but because they're entitled or they're bitches or whatever it is you know, they're, they're crybabies or they're lazy or, you know, they're, or they're, they don't have virtue. They want to just take from others. They're selfish. 
the the problem with those people is that they're violating the social contract. Okay. And that other people have to pick up for, and they're choosing to do so. So I want to talk about this, this one quick thing, this, so you guys remember we sponsored the Shaw classic and, and, um, part of the attendees, the strong men that went there were the, it was supposed to be Tom Stoltman, who's the world's strongest man. He's the two time reigning world's strongest man, his brother, Luke, you guys can look these guys, you can look them up on the, on YouTube. They're Stoltman brothers is their YouTube channel. They got a big YouTube channel. And the other day I saw that they said they were, they were taking a break from YouTube and I watched the video and I saw, and it basically the, the digital media strategist that they were using, this guy named Simon had suddenly quit and left them without anything, okay? They left them without a digital media team or whatever. And, si and the Simon kid, he published a video saying why I quit. He quit on, on the spot. And what he said was, is he had heard two words that changed his life forever. And that was, um, you're dispensable. Okay, so apparently the, 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 the message was, you know, you're dispensable. That is, you're, no one here isn't um, above being fired. And it really cast a really bad light on the Stoltman brothers. It made it look like they were treating their employees like shit, right? Because Simon really, he, he played a huge role in building, building up their, their YouTube channel and their, and their strength business and merchandise and all this stuff. And so then the Stoltman brothers come back and they, they do a response video and they, and they, and everybody, they all take the high road, right? They're all like, you know, we wish Simon the best, blah, 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 you know, and the Stoltman brothers didn't address the controversy. And, and obviously it was, they ended up losing tons and tons of subscribers because this kid came out and he said, you know, they said you're dispensable, which is true. You're dispensable. Okay. You're dispensable. I'm dispensable. I own the fucking company and I'm dispensable. Okay. Um, but because this kid, you know, who arguably did a lot of great work, right? And, 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 they obvi and obviously the Stoltman brothers care about this kid. They love him. You know, the team that's still there loves this kid. But what that kid did was he threw a temper tantrum. And for what? The price of that temper tantrum was to damage the company. The company that his friends and family get paid from. You know what I mean? Like, what did he gain? Like, it's one thing, it's one thing to give people bad news in order to help them. It's one thing to give people bad news in order to help them. My father you told me when I was a kid as a, as a parenting strategy, all, uh, all types of accountability are on the table. So if, if you meet somebody who responds to getting yelled at, use yelling as the way you motivate them. Like I, we have people here. We, in fact, we have people who work here who want to be yelled at in order to be motivated. And one of them is an executive leader. One of them is a, the chief operating officer wants conflict in, in order for him to be motivated. In fact, he requests it. Okay. There are other people who don't respond to that. And so what is the threshold, right? Well, the threshold is assuming that everyone's holding up their end of the bargain if I rip someone a new ass as a boss, okay, if I remind them that their paycheck every two weeks is a function of their ability to do their job alongside the, everyone else's ability to do their job, and that uh, over the course of an entire year, your output is greater than the sum of your parts, okay, if I remind them of that, that's me doing my job as a leader. It's my job to remind everyone how this works and to motivate them and to lead them and to set the example and set the strategies. But the threshold is, is that it doesn't matter how you feel in the moment that I'm holding you accountable. That's in inconsequential. My father used to tell us when we were kids. What matters is, is later that night when the emotions have died down, the person you held accountable says, you know what? He was right. Just like when you're raising your children, it doesn't matter how your kids feel about you when they're 16. It matters how your kids feel about you when they're 35. Because you're raising adults, you're not raising children. So it only matters what your kids think of you once they're adults and they can appreciate what you did to raise them when they were children. Okay, in, in, in this organization, John McLeod, 
is our chief experience officer. John, I have made it very clear to everyone, John is going nowhere. And the reason why is because John helped build this company. And I'm gonna tell you the story about McLeod and then we'll get into the embedded OPC UA discussion. And, and the lesson here is I want everyone to, if, if, if you're a person who's watching this podcast, you're listening to this podcast and you think you are indispensable, turn off the fucking video and never come back here again. Seriously, I don't want people like that in this community. We are all dispensable. The obstacle is the way. <laughs> the, cha the, the failure is the point. Learning through failure equals growth. We, we are all dispensable. All of us are on borrowed time. Every single one of us. And if you're the type of person who's going to get offended because someone reminds you you're dispensable, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. You don't belong in this community. You don't belong on my team, my internal team or external team. I don't want you here. I want people who go in with the mindset, I'm dispensable. There are people counting on me. There was a follow-up video to the Stoltmans, another internal employee posted another video. And if you look at it, it just came out this morning. It's about an hour or a minute long. And he says, what Simon said was not true. Okay. We love Simon. We wish him the best. There's no ill wills. But what he said wasn't true. No one said you're dispensable. What they said was the only people here who are not dispensable are me and Tom, Luke Stoltman and Tom. Now I've met Luke personally. I have not met Tom. I had a chance to spend a weekend with him. My son interviewed him. There is no nicer guy on the fucking planet. I mean, literally, he just shot a video on mental health a month ago. Like the, these guys are literally the, the kindest, most amazing people, really. Um, the, and, and yet they're, they're taking a beating. They're taking a beating in a, in a cancel culture world, uh, for, for honestly telling the truth. Truth matters. So what would be really great is if everyone in this community went over to the Stoltman brothers and subscribed to their channel, even if you don't want to watch their shit. If you went over and just subscribed, added subscribers, that would be great. Because that would be this community commu communicating to them that truth matters. I want to tell the story about McLeod and then we'll get an embedded OPC UA. Um, John, when I first started this company in 2015, there was a guy who had been selling to me. And his name was John McLeod. He, John is our chief experience officer. And um, he, he worked for a software vendor. And when I was the manager of Texas operations for another company, he, he had been trying to sell me the software. It was a, the alarm software for um, industry. And, um, and there was a discussion about maybe I buy the company. There, there, because the, the, that company happened to be for sale, the company he was working for. Anyway, he heard I went into business for myself and started this integrator and he called me. I still remember the phone call to this day. He calls me. I'm in my driveway at my house and he says, hey, Walker, it's John McLeod. He said, I heard that you went into business for yourself and I would love to come work with you. Like, I, you know, you're the kind of guy I want, I want to work with. You know, my experience with you has been phenomenal. I want to come work with you. I said, John, I, I, I love it. I, I love you. I think you're amazing. But. I don't have the money to hire you. I already have a business development guy. I don't have the money. He's, and John said to me, you don't have to pay me. He said, just let me come to and pitch to your team how I would do the business development and give me a shot. He goes, and I'll pay my own way as long as you give me this amount in commission once I start selling, once the pipeline fills up. And I said, how long will that take? And he said, probably about six months. I said, all right, I'll give you, this is what I'll promise you. You come here. You pitched to my team, there were eight of us at the time, your idea, including the existing business development manager. And if they all agree, we'll make it happen. We'll figure it out. And he said, deal. And he said, but I want to say one thing to you. He said, I believe you and I will be a great team. He said, I promise all I have to do is get you in the room with the right people. Your message, 
your your sincerity, your transparency, your authenticity. All I got to do is get you in the room with the right people and it'll take care of itself. He said, that that's my strategy. And I said, okay. And he said, and my promise to you is I'll never put you in the room with the wrong person. And I said, okay. So he came and he gave a pitch. This is when we're in a office off my garage. Okay, small little tiny apartment that we turned into an office, had a whiteboard on the wall. We set out eight folding chairs for my team to sit down. And John went up on the whiteboard and he literally wrote out a strategy, a business development strategy for attacking like five specific accounts in three specific verticals and what his approach would be. And we came out of that call, we came out of that meeting and I said, I need to figure out how to get this guy on board. And so we, we did a, like a, a, a stipend where he was going to get paid a certain amount as a stipend each month. Um, but it was a, a modest amount just to pay for him to travel around. And then he would, once he filled the pipeline, he would get paid a, a salary, which we agreed upon, plus a commission structure, which we agreed upon beforehand. And we originally said that was going to take six months. And he used his own savings. He used his own money to fund this. He took money out of his own savings to keep paying his bills to help build this up off the ground. And to this day, okay, by the end of that year, by December of that year, we broke a million dollars in sales in just a nine month window. With a team of eight, we broke a million dollars in sales. And when we did our Christmas party at a Dallas Cowboys football game, it was, it was like December 16th of that year. It was Cowboys versus Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You can look it up. I think it was December 2016, whatever it was. And we had a tent and tailgating and took everybody in the game. They had the whole team there giving out gifts and Christmas bonuses. And I got to announce that we broke a million dollars in sales in our first nine months. And fucking John did that. And to this day, we, we literally just, we, were, we had a suite at the Dallas Stars game at the American Airlines Center earlier this week. Okay, we had we had a suite, had our whole team there, uh, well, all the team here, and then there was a and the other half of the suite was some other company, and we're all talking and shooting the shit and introducing ourselves, and I told that story. You know, John helped build this company. Like John, he helped make this happen. That the Intellic integration does not exist if John McLeod didn't make the sacrifice that he made in order to help build it. And there have been many times where I have come down on John. There have been many times where I've chewed John's ass. There have been many times where I've said, John, you got to get your head in the game. But John never up, threw up his hands in the air and said, you hurt my feelings. I'm out of here. John's retiring in two years. Okay, John's retiring in two years. Our whole team is focused on John's retirement. Two years out. Not what are we going to do when John's gone, but how do we take care of John when he retires? And, and there were a million times where I've come down on John. But let me say this. I, I want to make this point. At Intellic Integration, we are more than the sum of our parts because our team is made up of people like that. John's not the only one here who's like that. Everyone on this team is like that. Our whole organization is built with people who understand that we're working towards a much bigger mission. But that doesn't mean that each and every one of us isn't dispensable, including me. All right. But I do make the joke. We hired a, a sales guy. I don't know, maybe three years ago and it didn't in his first week, him and John were just button heads and we were doing a staff meeting. I literally said to the guy and I liked him a lot. I said, I like you. I think you're awesome. I think you have a ton of potential, but you either figure out how to get along with John or you have to go. Cause he's going nowhere. John helped build this company. He's going nowhere. <laughs> All right. 